Okay. Let's see if I can get out. Let's see if we can do this. together thematically and um, as soon as I can get them lined up here. There you go. Uh, there it is. Okay. <coughs> against the reticulated spine of memory, a fog of splintering thought metals a briny mesh, immense dust clouds, the hollowed frame, towers loosen the web truss concrete plumes of flame, flesh incinerated in a hazy hate of retributive justice, falling from the heavens and bubbling from the earth, the sinking soul of a nation's lackluster be devil now in the holy name of God. Towers tumbling, souls leaping to death's escape, the searing madness of centuries lust, full whiteness, genocide now returning to crust over and fill the natty void where Sabers and hot lead rattled the body of the unsuspecting natives of a thousand lands high above the tree line, the Palisades and Central Park. So many mortal remains transitioned in an angry, blurting, redolent, and sentient now, wafting skyward from collapsing ground underneath the empire and all but lost forgotten names in the crush to covet, convert, mystify the weeping millions mortified by flash and replay flash and replay miasmic mental anguish, the pulsing desire to possess the lives and labor of have-not children of lesser gods, honest, simple people from colored stock seen antithetical to the white world illusion of power and justice and the American waywardness blessed by a demon-dealing deity of death, metal angels with silvery wings in the no-fly zone, pirouetting above Gotham, and dropping like hot lead into the nation's heart, retching awake the few who can see the silver bullet fired into the translucent body of defiled democracy in God's name and for his sake, amen. And then the awakening, the shattered morning when repeating Blitzkrieg newscasts told the tale of tears that stretched back to the chained march and terror of the long trek to the coast and the prison cell and cold stone of the castle that still haunts the island off the coast of Senegal and the sentient memories of black Americans who travel, airplanes slamming stone, John Henry's hammer, Ogun's anvil, Shango's thunderstone. We remember Elegba's crossroads, lest you forget. A cross, the decadent image of tales telling of love that delivers from 
beastly minions driven inward with the force of reason reinforced triggers memories of blood soaked ropes not in linear logic defying the gravity of family the gravitas of guns and butter drenched lies languishing in the mouths of whores with silver spoons digging shit from the assholes who send our sons to die in the minefields of their hate locked legacy of oppression aggression the maitre d at the door of america's table able-bodied brothers amputated fathers decapitated from their homes to naked the streets with no pearl glitter no hint of magic no dreams not deferred this white arts infused leprosy of maggots eating at the soul of an ancient body and the singing electric body roots and snakes energy spirals yanked from the souls of warriors shields sliced from the stellar of ancient cities drenched in fornicated memories and memoirs written by the conquerors who stretch forth iron arms from babylon to sparta to rome to alexandria to the British Isles, to the shores of the Americas, lovers of death, drinking the sweat of the poor raped daughters left when their husbands marched to war for the hoarding billionaires, waging our demise for blood dollars. Cristobal Columbus, father of the wicked growing in the empty bellies of ski mask savants, blood letting miscreants, with gaping sores for open eyes, miseries, vacant stare, lies hurled against the vulnerable children whose only mission is fun and wounds bound by the lie that they can be anything they want to be but not proud and not human, not now in multicultural America where brown bodies rise to become the phalanx of the empire unbeknownst to the mothers who have no more milk to give. Not now in this post-racial era, this colored delusion of white supremacy spewed from the grin of Obama preaching anti-war ravaged reason while ramping up death's iron arm in the name of the American people. Americans, Americans, well, of course, intellects poisoned by the lies dredged up to justify the rape of nations and the robber barons we have come to be in the name of the fame of comfort and security. We have never been the American people. Just the solid lot of the poor demonized masses yearning to be free for the dominion whose gold was our labor mined in fields of blood spilled across a world of oceans strewn with the collateral damage of America's wars on everything not white. The dead children's eyes smoke dry by war, flames licking moisture from their sea. There is no anger angry enough to appease this angst raging in the belly that loves so fiercely that it slays even the thought of union and place, murders this idea that this image is just, is the way forward into humanity. There is no anger angry enough to save us from the death that destroys the song, the possible singing in the throats of peace, be still. This Christian hypocrite place, this lying field of gargoyles who prophesy the demise of poor people civilized by tortures and mayhems and ritual blood sacrifices in the name of amens while selling iron arms to brain dead delinquents, killing their own to eat at the table with the worldwide tea party of killers, of killers, killing killers, and all who stand in their way. 
the peasant and the factory worker and the student and the mother suckling her young and the soft-eyed children playing football on barren hard rock dirt lots strewn with anti-personnel mines from mines bent on dollar profits that speak but one tongue kill and the world's oppressed billions hoping to convert the world's killers and all the killers grinning on their way to banks killers grinning as simple dignified people trudge to another day of work that pays the taxes that pays for the killers killing killers in the name of peace <laughs> Maybe questions, but I don't know about applause. Um, questions, comments. Don't be nice. <sighs> you don't have to be nice. That's a lot of pain to hear at one time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it's a pain that um, I live with every day. And it's a pain that I see all around me, even with the people who smile all the time and say that they're happy. It's a pain that I see. I and mean, I don't think that's particular to you either. I think right. we all feel that. And, and that's, that, that's the point of the poem, mm -hmm. is that we're encased with this and by this that um, we turn on the TV and if we're not watching murder stories, <laughs> <laughs> we're watching the news, which is a group of murder stories. Um, and the murder stories on the news are even more brutal than the murder stories that are put out there for entertainment. Um, and, and to think that we live in a place where murder is entertainment is painful. It's painful, um, and to think that that the taxes that you pay to stay on this side of the bars is paying for people dying instead of for life to be um, sustained and propelled forward. It's disturbing. I find America a disturbing place. And we don't learn that you read history over and over again. It's the same. So why don't we learn? Well, I think we learn, but, and I think, and that's a lot of what I was saying in here, is that we learn, we poor, dignified people learn, but we haven't understood yet that the game is really about power in that voting doesn't change anything except the faces that wield the power that kills. That's what we haven't learned. That's what I find so disturbing. Uh, this whole abomination um, of, uh, of the last three years with this black guy in the White House and, and the hope that that foreshadowed that was cut off time he got in office and appointed the same old white boy network of killers. I mean, that, for me, that has been the most disturbing thing in the last five years. It's that violation of trust that was generated by that politician. Because he he's a convincing, he is a convincing rhetoric, rhetoric how do you say it? Rhetoric. Yes. He's convincing. Okay? He he wields the word and he wields emotion. And 
he drew us in to that that pit of lies and we bought it not understanding that he's a politician and that he really wasn't going to do anything different and that any politician that gets in there is going to do the same thing because they don't really run the show. It's the people who are behind the scenes with the dollars calling the shots. That's the pain. The pain is the powerlessness that we feel here in the empire, the most powerful nation in the history of the world. The only empire that stands now. Obama's in Europe, he's coming back from Europe tomorrow to go to Missouri. So he can tell the people what he's going to do for them. In their, in their distress, having gone through this tornado. And they'll do a little bit, but if you look at New Orleans, it'll tell you what they're going to really do. And we keep buying it. You know, I mean, guilt. Bill Scott, uh, rest in peace, uh, said the revolution will not be televised. It won't be televised. The revolution won't be televised, but in America, they ain't going to be no revolution. Because all the little people coming up, they forgot how to fight. They, they don't know what they're fighting for. They fight each other. I took some kids to the playground. I took your son to the playground today. And they were playing just as nice and peaceful and so Kids from the community came in and, you know, I mean, I had to talk them down over a race. They were racing and the little boy lost because he wasn't fast enough. He wanted to fight because he lost. He wanted to fight because he lost a race. And he couldn't see the logic of not fighting. He couldn't understand that he was fighting with somebody who looked just like him that he was fighting with a family member. He couldn't understand that. We don't understand that, that when we look across the border to Afghanistan, that when we look across the border to the Palestinians, that when we look across the border to Sudan, we're looking at our brothers and sisters. They're the human beings that we're looking at. But the politicians tell us they're the enemy. And we buy it. That's the pain. That's the pain to my <laughs> and, and it's funny that you mention that because when, when I decided I was going to read it, I said, I, I was looking for a happy poem. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for a happy poem. And I've got a folder, and, and I don't know, it's six months worth of work in there. There's nothing in there that's happy. Everything is talking about the state of this pain that is so intense. I have to go back a long way to find a happy pain. I was, tem I was tempted to ask you the same question I asked Paul. When, when do you envision yourself writing the domestic comedy? <laughs> is, that, is that a dream that we all should have? I mean, in spite of the, the pain and, and the... It's, it's, it's a dream that I have. Yeah. Okay, I mean, it is definitely a dream that I, I want to write something that is uplifting, not just consciousness raising, but uplifting. Something that says, we human beings get it and we know how to make it work. Whew. I'm hoping that I get to write that before I die. Like you, I'm planning to finish a book this summer. The book, I have a title for the book, and I have to work all over the place. I just have to pull it together. The book is, the title is, <laughs> who we? Blood, Bones, Books, and Bullets. I will. I would love to have the time to write myself out of this, out of this, this.
position in life. But I don't, I, I don't, I don't see it coming great very seriously. You know, I, I look, uh, I look at my children uh, from 37 to 13, and you know, it makes me want to stay here to do what I can to protect them. Is, is an illusion. Uh, and so it's just about what can I what can I put down that at some point in their life will will connect with them so that they understand where they're really at. Because I tell them all the time, but, you know, I'm just their father, what do I know? I don't do anything. <laughs> The world's a wonderful place, you know. We've been blessed with rain. Some people would say we've been cursed with rain. <laughs> we've been blessed with rain for the last two months. It's been raining, raining, raining. What is that telling us? What is nature telling us about ourselves? How closely do we pay attention to the grass that's growing, to the trees as they bloom in the spring, to the flowers that come up out of the ground, to the way that the earth has swollen with this moisture. How closely do we pay attention? Because that's where, that's where it's at. If we want to be renewed, revitalized, that's where it's at. It's in the earth. It's in the earth. It's in the heavens. It's not in the White House. It ain't in Congress. I mean, you know, my mama said, if you don't have something good to say about somebody, keep your mouth shut. I, I find that so difficult. <laughs> I find that so difficult because I look at those people in Congress and I, I, I can't. I understand. I mean, they just make no sense whatsoever. No sense whatsoever. Throwing our money down the drain for war and profit. War and profit. But we're not profiting. We keep paying.
I work with children because they keep me honest. I have worked with adults. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not interested in intellectual debates. Intellectual debates are a large part of what has gotten us where we are at today. We need action and feeling and emotion. Emotion. Energy in motion. Emotion leads to feeling. Emotion is simply the natural pattern of the world moving through us. Feeling is how we interpret that emotion moving through us and what we do with it. Our humanity, our humanity responds to our experience. That flash of lightning out there tells me that I'm human. George Bush and Barack Obama cannot tell me anything about my humanity. Mitch Daniels can't tell me anything about my humanity. That rain tells me about my humanity. These elements, your laughter, tells me about my humanity. It's those things that we grasp, that I grasp, that I have to hold on to that keep me vulnerable. America is all over the world with its military. When the greatest threat to America is right here, Right here, in this place, in this America, this is where the greatest threat is. And what is that threat? That threat is those people, those white people at the bottom of the economic ladder, where they get tired of being stepped on and they understand that They've been fucked over. They're going to tear America up. America cannot avoid what it has produced. It's not going to come from black people. Black people sedated. We are sedated. We are narcotized. It's going to come from, not the Tea Party, because the Tea Party is just a, they appear. It's going to come those people whose houses have been taken, those people who can't get their children in the schools that they think they need to get them into, it's going to come from those veterans who come home from these insane wars and are living in the streets because they can't get a job and they can't get the, the medical services that they need. That's where it's going to come from. It's going to come from the people who get tired. The prison population continues to grow. But you're letting those people back out on the streets. The, be the, 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 the best place to educate a person is in prison. Because in prison, you don't have anything else to do. So if you give me something positive to do, you give me some books, you give me a teacher, you give me people who are going to relate to me as a human being, you don't never have to worry about me again. I'm going to be the best citizen you can find. But that won't happen. Because that won't build the industry. See, the prison industry has to be built so that poor white people can go to work. Because when poor white people don't have a job, they get a problem. All you got to do
do is look at the labor movement. Look at the 30s and 40s, the history of the 30s and 40s in America. Who was raising the hell? Who was tearing things up? America cannot escape its fate. I keep writing about it and writing about it and writing about it. I've been writing about it for 40 years. It's going to happen. The only question at this point is how do the people who are sane, center the activity? How do the same people? Now the same people are not the people who do the same thing every day and expect to change. That's most Americans. Most Americans do the same thing every day, every day, every day, every day. Get up, go to work, pay the bills, do everything right. Don't speed. Go to the supermarket and buy the food. Don't read the labels. The definition of a crazy person is somebody who does the same thing over and over and over again every day and expects the change to show up. That's insane. That's nuts. Mm -hmm. That's really nuts. Artists, artists foreshadow what's going to show up. I didn't have any question about why, why you write about dark fantasy. Because this is a dark place we live in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you think that was fantasy, just look at Disneyland. That's some fantasy. <laughs> well, we just had that front page story of that mother and that little baby on top of it. So it's only so shocking, really. We live it every day. But we be, because, because we're comfortable, because we're secure, because we feel safe, we let ourselves say, oh, well, that's just an aberration. That's, it's not really that way. It's that way. When you leave the country, when you leave America, or if you go south in America, or go west in America, or go east in America, or go deep into the, the bowels of the Midwest, and look at how people are living. It's that way. This is a disturbing, disturbing place. And, and to be as complacent as we are is a curse upon our heads. But I, th I think you say we feel safe, but I think much of what we believe is put there because we're made to fear. Oh, yes. If you, you fear. Okay, if you don't do what we say and we have the weapons and we do this and we, some terrible thing is going to happen, we accept that and we say, okay, we'll build your weapons, do this, pay that, and yes, I'll help. You know, so, so safe, not necessarily. The more we feel Fear. Yes. Yes, we feel safety in fear. We feel safe with the fear because they they purport that there's a greater fear out there. Bin Laden is coming to get <laughs> us. We must fear him. So in order for us to be safe, we have to have the Patriot Act. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I ain't worried about Bin Laden or Zawiri. I'm worried about, I'm worried about the Patriot Act. I'm worried about the police who in Indiana can come into your house. I'm worried about those things. Why? Because I live with that.
the terror beyond the door always seems more threatening than the terror in the house. I, I, I would love to be an optimist. And I guess in many ways I am an optimist because I keep getting up every morning. And I manage a smile children make me laugh, so I'm an optimist in that regard. But when it comes to grown folks' business, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> I'm a pessimist. Well, you have to read this Time that just magazine that just came out, which has a whole section on our optimistic um, uh -huh. brain movements. kind of interesting. Uh -huh. Well, I thank everybody for coming out. It's been very good. When you finish your story, come back and read it. Okay. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Craig, uh, for bringing us Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Coca-Cola. Thank, thank you for the time to spend with children. Um, that's that's my pleasure. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's a gift to me. That's, that's uh, the ancestor's gift to me, is my, my love for working with young people. Uh, it's a wonderful young people. I, I have to look for a cave or a, uh, a, a desert island or something, someplace where I can get away from grown folks. Grown folks make me crazy. Well, that's a gift to you, but I think it's also a gift to the community mm -hmm. that, that we have you to do that. Oh, well, and the kids. <clears throat> I was a kid, and <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask for my kids. So. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing, actually. Yeah, we go back a little way. Um, thank you again. Uh, the next, we have three more sessions in this season. Um, the first, no, the second and the fourth um, Saturdays in June, and then the second Saturday in July. And all of those right now will be open mics. Mm -hmm. So we're just inviting folks to come on out, bring your work, and let's share. Let's share. Uh, there's such a need, you know, not for entertainment. I, 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 I can't buy into entertainment. Um, there's such a need for sharing. I want to know your story. Mm -hmm. Tell me your story, because then I know who you are. I know how you resonate with me. Uh, I, I don't need to be entertained. I'm too old to be entertained. Uh, I can entertain myself. Every time I jump on my drums, I entertain myself. <laughs> uh, love to entertain myself. Uh, so come on out and share your work. Share, share your creativity. Share your insight. Share your philosophy. You don't have to be an artist <laughs> to come and do this. You just have to have a passion for people uh, and something to say. You know, I think that that most of us have something to say if 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 we're coaxed to do it and supported in the doing. Uh, and this is a supportive place. I thank you and have a great evening and don't get too wet. And don't curse the rain. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 